Hello, welcome to the webinar today. We at Gem Atlas are glad to have Rui Galupim de Calvajo and Haley Henning with us today to talk about the uh, topic, Romancing the Stone, Facts and Storytelling at the Retail Level. Rui is a gem education consultant, author and international lecturer on gemology and the history of gem materials. He is the founder of the Home Gemology webinar series launched during the COVID-19 lockdown. He is also the editor of the educational account and shares gemological content actively across social media. He is an associate editor of Gem A's Journal of Gemology, vice president of Sector A and the Coral Commission of Sibjo and member of several other gem and jewelry associations. Haley serves as CCO of Greenland Ruby, a ruby and pink sapphire mining operation in South East Greenland. Haley is responsible for, glowing, for global client relationships, prospects, communications, branding, and marketing. She has led many tours of the mine in Greenland for customers, journalists, gemological laboratories, and others. In 2018, Jamie founded the Pink Polar Bear Foundation, which is a Greenland Ruby CSR initiative, and also made Greenland Ruby the first colored gemstone mining me uh, member of the Responsible Jewelry Council. Gem Atlas is a global B2B networking platform for the gems and jewelry industry. We have over 100,000 members in over 150 countries. Recently, Gem Atlas launched a diamond demand app called GA Demands, which helps users connect with the right suppliers and buyers for natural lab-grown and parcel diamonds domestically at no cost. With several features already available, we have also recently launched a knowledge section for all industry insights, access to all our webinars and articles at your fingertips. The app is currently only available for Indian mobile numbers, and we will soon be updating it to grow internationally. At the end of the webinar, there will be a Q&A session. Please put your questions in the Q&A section on your screen. We're so glad to host this panel discussion. Let's jump right into the discussion. Um, knowledge is a very powerful tool and can make or break our business. Rui, uh, today we see a lot of salespeople selling without having adequate knowledge and that we could, and it could be detrimental to our industry. How does one keep themselves educated and knowledgeable constantly about our industry and what different materials can be used to do so? Are there any courses or videos that you would suggest that they could take, take up? And how important is it to keep up to date with the industry? Rui? Hi, good morning or good afternoon, good evening or good tomorrow to, ev to, to everyone in the panel. Uh, in the audience, I mean, and, and to you, Privit, uh, thank you very much for this invitation. It is, a, it is a pleasure to be here and an honor to be next to Haley, that uh, I admire so much as one of the best marketeers in our industry for color gemstone. So it is a privilege to be here. So you asked me so many questions. I will try to remember them all. So um, what should we do if we have uh, people in our industry at the retail level that are, might not be knowledgeable enough to tell a story and to sell a product uh, conveying the exact information for the customer to make an informed decision on the purchase. Well, <clears throat> we have two, two ways to deal with it. One is the, um, the owner, the, the owner, the business owner to understand how critical educating their staff is and investing in education, making sure that even if the staff is not aware that they are not knowledgeable, at least the business owner will give them the tools to at least become more knowledgeable. Then there is an educational path to do. The, there are a lot of information out there. The internet has a wealth of information. It does also have a wealth of misinformation. So the critical thing is to know exactly where to look for. Um, there are lots of uh, places where you can do so. I mean, you can check my own social media, but I'm trying not to self-promote myself here. Um, but you have uh, a lots of gemology schools out there, both in Europe, in Asia, in the United States, in Southern America. They all compete with each other for, for the customers, <laughs> for students. So it's better not to me to indicate specifically which can be which can be uh, credible and good for them. For example, in Europe, uh, there, there is a, a federation of education and gemology called FEEG, F-E-E-G, that consolidates 
the most important schools in Europe. So uh, uh, appointing FIG, I'm not making competition within them. So it's like an organization that uh, has an umbrella over many educational uh, organization. In the United States, we have so many as well. Maybe the most important one or the most famous one is GIA, but there is competition there as well. And in Asia, we have also many schools that can give that type of information. But as far as I'm concerned for a salesperson, more important to know gemology in terms of the technical technicalities in gem identification, they must know their products in plain language. And they must also always um, know the facts of the products, but they need storytelling. They need also to romance the stone. And this is probably where Haley can come in and adds value to that knowledge. So I think education is twofold. One is the technical, factual, material information about the materials composing a jewelry mm -hmm. artifact. In this case, we are talking about gemstones. And then you have the other stories that need to be told to the customer so they can be excited about that purchase and then they can make a decision with two, these two factors, the more emotional and the more rational, if you want to call them that way. So I think both can go together. Not that my kind of knowledge competes with Haley's, but I, I can deliver some type of information. And what marketeers do is to collect information and put it on a very colorful and very entertaining and also fascinating way so the consumer can become excited about the product. And so I think for education, as far as I'm concerned, they should be together. Okay, that's 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 great to hear. So, uh, actually, this that was a great point about storytelling that you were uh, that you're saying. So, uh, I mean, let's say that uh, that the sales that the salesperson has the knowledge about their product, and it's very, it is very important to be able to communicate and present that product in. <clears throat> in a storytelling way. Uh, they're businesses that are over 50 years old and people behind them have a lot of product knowledge. However, to express this can be a challenge for them. Um, Haley, we were wondering how can one communicate this knowledge in a storytelling manner to the consumer? Because sometimes people who are intelligent in the industry, uh, in industry knowledge, find it hard to translate and share that knowledge in a digestible way for the consumer. So what, what do you suggest for this? Hi, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, I see participants all over the world. So a very warm greeting from me here in Miami, actually. And thank you for inviting me on this panel. And thank you very much for the very flattering introduction. And of course, to Rui, um, it's an absolute privilege to be in a discussion with you and um, thank you Privy, for inviting me to, to participate in this very interesting topic, uh, mm -hmm. which we are finding um, consumers um, all, all over the world and, and, and gem dealers and, um, and retailers, you know, learning more and more about how to actually sell their product. And of course, storytelling, uh, fact and fiction, um, most definitely a very, very big part of this. So thank you for having me. Um, to answer your question, and um, just to elaborate a little bit on what uh, what Rui talked about, um, you know, we're all human beings at the end of the day, and um, of course, we want as many facts. I mean, in today's world, what we're finding with the consumer is uh, chances are by the time they've walked into a store, they pretty much know what they're looking for. They, they're walking into a store um, to sort of make final decisions. And that's really where the, the actual sale is going to take place and the convincing side of the sale. Um, and again, just to, to reiterate what Rui said, I am no retailer. I'm, I'm no expert uh, in the retail um, side of our business, but it is our responsibility to educate and to tell the stories behind the stone. We are, um, as, as gem, um, gemstone industry uh, professionals, the, the gemstone very often is, is really just one of the ingredients in the final retail, in the final product. You know, there's, there's all kinds of components that go into a piece of jewelry. And what is it that's going to really make the difference when that uh, consumer walks into a store and, and they're looking for something 
um, to buy. And they, they, what they're really looking for is, is, is a education or a storytelling that's going to convince them one way or another. So it's really up to that salesperson at that stage to, to do that final push over, over the, the sales line. We, it is, and it is our responsibility to equip that person with the necessary knowledge. And how, does, how exactly does that trickle down? Um, you know, from my perspective, Greenland Ruby is a mining operation. And one might say it's not really my responsibility to, you know, go beyond, you know, mining gemstones and getting them into the marketplace. But I argue against that it is my responsibility because it's not in my interest just to sell a gemstone here and a gemstone there. It's in my interest that our customer, the jewelry manufacturer or the designer, is successful too. And the only way to do that is to educate the person behind the counter. And like what Rui said, not just with facts gemological, but with the story behind the stone. Where do these gemstones come from? How are they mined? Uh, what does the origin look like? How does it feel? One of my mentors is Richard Hughes. Many of you have probably heard of him. He is the founder and owner of the Lotus Laboratory in Bangkok. But in the early days of my career, one of the first presentations I was in uh, was a presentation by, by Richard Hughes. And um, he actually said in that presentation that colored gemstones link people with places. And this has always stuck with me and been really you know, one of these um, catchphrases throughout my career, because it is my responsibility to link colored gemstones with people and places. Um, like what I've done with, uh, with Greenland Ruby, the rubies and pink sapphires from Greenland. It's very unlikely that anybody uh, may even travel to such an icy remote location, but we can actually put so a sensation into people's minds and hearts that they too can own a little bit of somewhere exotic. Um, and, and so that I'm rambling on a little bit now, but to answer your question, Previ, I mean, this is exactly what it's all about, is really bringing the storyline home and, and, and making that consumer feel a connection to create the pull and the desirability to walk out of the store with something that they really can feel emotionally attached to. Okay. Okay. That's, that's a, that was very uh, helpful. That, that actually did help quite a lot. Um, so Rui, from an education point of view, what do you feel are the top three challenges that you face while training small or large organizations? Be, be, before I answer, that's a very important question. Uh, I have to comment on a very important aspect that Haley mentioned, which is the emotional part of the sale. Uh, first of all, I don't know how many salespeople do we have on the audience, but the salespeople at the counter, the retailers, they are the ones collecting the money to the whole industry. Uh, and they when, they, when they close a sale and the card swipes and uh, there is credit, uh, or when they collect the money from the customer, they are collecting the money for the jeweler, the wholesaler, the lapidary personnel, uh, all the guys that supply tools uh, for the lapidary process and for the retailing business to everyone. So the salespersons, they are, the, for me, the most important actors in our industry. They are the faces of our industry and they are the ones collecting all our money. I mean, everything I have, I owe it to people buying jewelry. Otherwise, I wouldn't have a job. Maybe Haley wouldn't have a job. And uh, right. uh, pre maybe you, pre you wouldn't have a job. So we rely on consumers to buy our products. I don't buy nor sell anything. I'm just a consultant. But we need consumers to buy. Yeah. And we have fierce competition with other luxury products and luxury experiences. And note the word experience. One thing is a product. The other thing is an experience. And storytelling can actually turn a product 
into a, an experience, a personal experience when people travel, for example, to icy Miami, where Haley is, when, when they travel, for example, to Greenland. And when, when we read about, uh, if you follow Vincent Pardieu, social media um, on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, he's travel, I like to act, actually, he's in Afghanistan right now, but he travels to Greenland all the time. And he's a great storyteller, but for people like me, I'm a geek. I like geology, I like mineralogy. So I totally relate with his storytelling about the geology, the places, the feelings of what's being a field gemology. And uh, he's one of the best in the world in that, in that uh, job. So whenever I read his story, I put myself there. In the, in the place, but when a consumer, and make no mistake, people that buy jewelry, they buy because of emotion. They don't buy because it is an investment. They may be buying because it might be some value, a portable value they, they, can, they can carry and they, they, they can liquidate easily because as you know, gems and jewelry, we can liquidate them quite easily, uh, meaning you can turn jewelry into money quite fast. So it, it might not be an investment because you have the profit of people that sold and that's a legitimate profit. But over time, if the thing, if the jewel is very good, you will eventually have more value. And it has so many examples throughout history that the, the value involved in jewelry has, has come up. So, but that's, that's another discussion. But when people buy jewelry today, they want to do the right thing. They want to buy something that means something that might have, a, a, when they are buying, they also have an experience of, uh, an emotional experience of traveling to those remote places and maybe helping this foundation, helping that community, helping carbon offset, helping something. And, and more and more consumers, they are choosing uh, not only the product, but what's it with the product. What is the story and what is the uh, emotion, the experience behind the story? And education should, should focus on that as well. And now I forgot the question you've asked me. <laughs> Sorry, oh, no, I, you have I, to repeat that one. Oh, no, so actually, uh, I want to kind of bounce. Oh, the challenges, the challenges, yes. Um, one of the biggest challenge, yes. I'm sorry, if I might uh, interject, just for, uh, kindly interject. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask you one point based on the investment value uh, that uh, that. Don't, don't ask. I'm not a market analyst. Oh, no, I'm no, a boring no. intellectual. Oh no, it's actually not that. It's it it bounces off of that. Uh, okay. Like so, so, there used to be a lot of people who used to invest in diamonds and gemstones. Uh, now there are various other avenues of investments that people are moving away from. Uh, like, you know, uh, from our industry also. Uh, so how do you excite them? Actually, this, this question could be to Haley or Rui, but how do you excite that section of the community as well as the younger generation to start investing in diamonds and gemstones? And what methods That's, can you use to bring back the appreciation towards our industry? That's not the kind of education I can convey, honestly. Uh, I'm, I'm the boring guy that knows about minerals, rocks, and gems and can tell uh, what the products are. And for example, and this is uh, going back to your question, uh, when you have two sapphires and one is heated and the other one is not heated, and why is one more valuable than the other? And that requires knowledge to understand what is heat treatment or uh, what is the amount of stones that can be treated or not treated. And knowing exactly that when you have um, um, a sapphire, ruby, an emerald that has a report saying that there are no evidences of such and such treatment, that is something that has a value. And at the counter, uh, salespeople, they must know exactly how to convey that message of how unique can be that product, that gemstone in that jewel that deserves an extra money, an extra dollar price tag. Uh, the, uh, diamonds, they are very easy. Diamonds are the easiest uh, gemstone in our industry. You have the, uh, the so-called four C's factors. And if you understand the four C's, you can understand how, how more expensive one can be through the other. It's like going to a restaurant, the filet mignon is, is more expensive than the very hard beef. So you don't need man, much education to know that. Or the cashmere is more expensive than lamb's wool, for example. You don't need education to know that one is better than the other. So the salesperson needs 
to convey those value factors. And that is the strategic advantage of at the counter. And that is how I can deliver that kind of help. If it is investment or not, not, not me. <laughs> I, I, I would know how to give arguments on that. That's more financial. That's more marketing uh, than gemology and mineralogy and the boring science behind the gems. Haley, would you like to give a... Yeah, I would like to just comment because I'd like to reiterate a little bit what Rui says. You know, when it comes to investment and uh, and finance, this is also not my area of expertise. Um, but I'm. that's not to say that colored gems don't, don't, don't hold enormous value. They do. And, you know, the rarity of these gems is just sometimes very hard to describe or very hard even to put a value. I mean, for somebody in the industry, such as myself, who understands colored gemstones and the origin of these gems. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, they're all undervalued because you know the mining processes are so complex. These gems are so extraordinarily rare um, that you know, as far as I'm concerned, everything is is pretty much undervalued by the time it gets to the retail count counter. Um, it is, though, however, very very difficult to talk about investments and especially. It's a, it's a very um, compromising situation to put a retail salesperson in. If somebody says, well, what kind of an investment is, is this? You know, it, it's, it's complicated. So I always like to talk about a personal investment in something that you absolutely love, that you've fallen in love with, because at the end of the day, you know, especially with color gemstones, you know, the, the, the investment and the beauty is in the eyes of the beholder what might be very valuable to me may not be very valuable to Rui you know what may be important to me may not be you know it's it's very very complex with colored gemstones and that's what makes our industry so interesting and so mysterious in a way um, because the, the the diamond industry I mean we, we do go buy a certificate you know there is it's a standard pricing and then of course when we talk about very big and very important stones it's something very different and that's a whole different category there is an enormous investment um, industry around these kinds of gemstones but when we're talking about you know everyday purchases these are emotional purchases we 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 have learned just even in the last couple of years that jewelry remains to be an emotional purchase you know a, a, a jewelry tends to be either um, you know, it, it, a gift or a gift to oneself, you know, depending on, on how one looks at it. But these are emotional purchases, you know, this is pretty much so. And of course, while there are investment purchases going on, we tend to leave that a little bit more to um, sort of more investment type analysts. And certainly when it comes to color gemstone investment, it's an extremely complicated topic and really not something that even a retail um, salesperson uh, should pe perhaps handle. So I do say, you know, not to delve into something that's that's more complicated than what they can deal with, but more to talk about a personal investment in these colored gemstones, owning something that is extremely rare and knowing just how rare that is, is a, is a value in itself. Okay, great. So I think uh, we can, can can I can I please just add, add one more thing that I think it's it's quite important at the sales uh, counter. Uh, it's up to the professional salesperson to understand what kind of consumer do we have in front of us, right? And uh, cater the narrative towards uh, getting that customer interested. For example. I, I'm that kind of customer that I like the technicalities. I'm the boring guy. As you see, I'm the guy with the books. So if a, if a salesperson starts telling me the story of the tropical area, very remote, that doesn't touch me. But if he says about, oh, this has chromium. And you see, uh, when you put the spectroscope, you see this peak and it is because it comes from this mine only and it hasn't been treated, as you can see from the whatever characteristic, that excites me. But then we have another type of consumer that likes to be excited with something else. Selling is pretty much like seducing. If you are in a bar, and I think everyone here in the audience has, has this experience, if we don't hold a little bit of a mystery of what we are trying to sell, then the girl or the man, they just go away. They find it very un un uninteresting. So you need that kind of charisma, but that's not sale, that's not gemology or mineralogy, that's being a salesperson. And they must know exactly what type of information 
uh, they must um, <clears throat> throw into the customer to be able to seduce him into the purchase and uh, having always in mind that the, the customer must make an informed decision um, and must be really confident and really well and really uh, confident that he's spending money uh, with, for something that he really fancies because he loves it or because he understands the value or because it has chromium or it has something else in it. So um, it must be an informed decision uh, through the customer, but it is up to the salesperson to have the information to deliver, but that information is through education, self-education, or through some kind of system of privately uh, held or a, in in a, in a gemology school. So it's up to it's up to him to decide. But he must he uh, a salesperson must not tell an, an encyclopedic um, array of information to the consumer. Otherwise, some types of consumers might lose the interest in the product. So, but that's being a salesperson and salespersons, if you are in the audience, you know, you must seduce the customer, seduced in the, in the professional way, not uh, the other way. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Rui. Uh, so yeah, we could actually go back to the previous question, but like, you know, what, what, are, what do you feel are the top three challenges that you face while training a small or large organization? Uh, and also- you, you ask me? So yes, yes, Rui. You're yes. asking me? Yeah, yeah. The, sometimes the challenge is like the, the they they say from my personal experience when when I when I do that kind of services or when they tell me that oh they, this kind of gemology course in this or that school they are very expensive well it's much more expensive to have bad reputation to have to have to deal with reputational damage it is much more expensive and the bigger the organization the bigger the company the more expensive it is to to take care of that reputation. So every dollar, uh, euro or yen that is spent on education for, to the salesperson, either it is gemology, sales techniques, um, ethic, uh, ethic uh, practices, uh, good governance, et cetera, every dollar spent on educating your sales staff, is, it's, a, it's worth, it's cheap when compared to something that might occur throughout a, a salesperson because even in good faith if he's not if he if he said something wrong then the reputational damage can be bigger and i have seen so many of those experiences that when people say that well I, i'm too expensive or this school or that school that's a lot of money i always say it's cheaper to pay that money to whoever you are hiring the services than to having to deal with reputational damage along the line Prevention is better than cure, I guess. Ah, absolutely. And and in our industry, I have come across so many of these things. I have an audience of salespeople, and some of them they have been in the industry for many many years, and nobody has ever invested on them in in education, and they were not aware that they needed more information, and they were. Uh, they were probably not being professional in their professions, but then they understood the value of educating themselves. And in our industry, because we, we deal with beautiful products, with valuable, exciting, fascinating products, sometimes they, the products <clears throat> sell themselves. But if we think that we are musicians or singers, and if you, if you want to fill a stadium of people listening to your music, you must exactly know how to play the instrument or to sing. The only guy that can sell tickets without knowing how to sing is Bob Dylan. He doesn't know how to sing, but he fills up stadiums. But that's a, that's a special one. But in our industry, we must be professional so people listen to us. Otherwise, uh, it can be bad along the line. Definitely, definitely. Um, so, uh, Haley, not everyone is born with the capacity to have the gift of the gab. And as you know, selling and marketing are very different. Uh, so this question is more towards like, you know, the marketing people uh, to get pointers from and how and how to better communicate their message to their multitude of channels. What do you feel are those two or three things to practice and focus on to really get better at the pitch and providing a brief to market the product, to tell a story of the product, to basically to, to sell the product is, uh, essentially? Well, thank you for the question. In my experience, we have to provide as much information as we can of, of our product. 
and that's exactly what, what, what I've done in the case of Greenland Ruby. Um, you know, like what we've been discussing for the last half hour, it's not enough that we just sell the gemstones onto the manufacturer or the jewelry designer. It's in my interest that the retail salesperson knows what it is that's in that piece of jewelry. So, and not everybody does this, but for example, I've taken it upon myself to create our own training manual, which is an online training um, or, or it can it can indeed also be printed out like sort of a magazine content. And it's it's really for everybody that has the opportunity to to sell a piece of jewelry that contains one of our gemstones. So I make that available to everybody and anybody who may be in the position of needing to know what that gem is all about. You know, whether it's a seasoned salesperson, you know, that, 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 that knows their stuff um, or whether it's somebody that just comes in on a Saturday morning, you know, to help out in a store, it's within my interest that they know exactly what they're selling. So, and, and I can't rely even on the owner of the retail store to relay that information. I mean, they, there's, there's tons of product, tons of different jewelry, tons of gemstones, in any retail environment. So it's in my interest that I provide that little booklet and whether it's a physical printed out booklet or whether the sales associate sort of gets that online and they read it on their telephone, you know, on the subway or, you know, on the bus on the way to work, that they know exactly what that gemstone is. So, you know, that and it seems very basic, but just think, it, think how important that is. So I actually designed this little, you know, Greenland Ruby 101, so to speak you know, talking about everything about the stone in a very simple, uncomplicated way. And after each paragraph, there is, you know, the key terminology that I've used in that paragraph so that salespeople can become familiar with terms and terminology, you know, some gemological and some very, you know, very, very much more basic. Um, and then, of course, at the end, I also have a little testing section. So it really is like a little textbook which seems very simple, but I know that if a sales associate has, you know, read this book cover to cover and it's not complicated and it's not that long, but they know everything that they need to know about this gemstone, which is really going to equip them with the tools for when somebody walks into a store and says, can you show me something? Uh, you know, I'm looking to buy something nice or, hey, you know, what is it that's in this counter that they actually, you know, the words sort of flow off their tongue. I mean, isn't that exactly what we want? Because like what Rui says, at the end of the day, this is what keeps us all in business. This is what, you know, ensures that our mind stays operating is that person that walks into the store and buys, buys a gemstone, a gemstone piece of jewelry. So, um, yeah, I think that that's the most important thing. It's not um, also forget the role of social media in the last couple of years and um, how much education we actually provide through social media. And, um, you know, this is not just social, this is really media and this is education. To Rui's point, when he mentioned Vincent Pardio, I mean, this is a gentleman that's got, you know, many, many followers. Um, this is very technical information that Vincent uh, shares, but very, very important, um, you know, really creating knowledge and understanding of where gemstones are from, from a field gemology point of view. But I also want to mention other influencers who have taken it upon themselves to educate. I mean, we call them, and social media calls, calls them influencers, but really what they are are educators, you know, and, and it's very difficult to put a value on, 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 on the work these people do. They are really putting information out there that has, has become absolutely invaluable to us. And it's very, very difficult to put a, put, put a price on that. Because it just takes, you know, one person to read something in a social media feed and to be convinced that they would like to own a ruby or pink sapphire from Greenland or an emerald from Colombia or from Colombia, whatever the case may be. You know, it's through these people that our business actually drives. So yeah. Yeah. Um, you asked me three, I've mentioned two, you know, one is the sort of hard and fast sort of textbook or, you know, of marketing material. The other is, of course, social media. And then 
of course, through panels like this discussion, yeah. you know, but, but these kinds of discussion, we very much speaking, I think within our industry, although through social media, we've gone outside of our industry because this is accessible to everybody. So, you know, we, we, um, we hope that people sign up and sign in to listen to these panels so that yeah. they become yeah. more and more familiar. I mean, we certainly put the information out there. So we hope that this has far, far and wide reach. Perfect. So, uh, so actually, it's great that you mentioned social media. So social media is a global uh, phenomenon, like, you know, like everyone in the world uses social media. And since diamond gemstones and jewelry sales and marketing is done worldwide, how does culture play a part in the way that certain points should be communicated? And how should, and not just communicated, but how should a brand position itself? Uh, like you know, to 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 really uh, to really sell their jewelry well, you could say. Is this a question for me? Yes, yes. If, uh, if you'd like to take. And it. actually, it's a very interesting question. We have lots of discussions internally around these questions um, of concerning culture and how does one market in in different um, locations and and to different cultures, and the answer is that there's no one size that fits all. Um, for sure. And so for this reason, it's not an easy question to answer because of course, social media is, is global. And when we speak to one person, we speak to many, um, not just in you know, one, one, one country or one culture. So I think the, the answer to that is to be very clear on, on your brand messaging and to be very sensitive to whom you're marketing and to try you know, to try and understand a little bit, but I think if you're true to your brand, you know, this uh, at, at Greenland Ruby, we are, you know, we're a global organization and, um, you know, we have audiences all over the world. We are, we're marketing not only in the US, of course, which is where I'm based, but, you know, we have a very strong European following. We, uh, we have a reach, you know, throughout uh, Asia um, and of course, we our, our our mining operation is in Greenland, so we've got a large audience um, that 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 happens in these Scandinavian countries. It's impossible that that what happens in the U.S. you know matches the same as what happens in China or in Australia, for example, or in in Greenland. But just to be sensitive and just to be uh, very clear on what our brand messaging is and consistent on that messaging, and I think everybody sort of appreciates that at the end of the day. If, if, I, if I can comment, uh, uh, that's a, a really critical uh, question here because well, what, there is one thing which is identitarian culture that um, is, is different in Europe. Even within Europe, we have countries with different sensibilities, uh, the same in Asia, Africa, in the Americas, etc. But there are some things that are um, almost common to every culture, to civilization in the 21st century, especially in the generations that will become the future consumers. And if we talk about, I don't want to use the word sustainability because it has been overused, but uh, let's just say doing the right thing, whether it is for the environment, for social or labor or child uh, um, uh, rights, human empowerment, and so many other uh, big, the civilizational themes that are uh, that makes us a better society. All of those values, they are. If we look into the narratives of of the of the bigger brands, we see a lot of that in their narratives. And one thing is talking the talk; the other thing is walking the walk. But uh, uh, talking the talk at, at least is some it's something already, and it takes time. It takes time to make. Uh, that kind of civilizational uh, change. And the jewelry industry has been playing a part. Greenland Ruby is a, is a good example, but we have more examples in the industry that they want to do the right thing. And of course they communicate that they are doing the right thing so they can have more sales arguments when they, when they are promoting their own products. So I think culture, identitarian culture, national culture, or regional culture is one thing, but then you have civilizational values like the uh, United Nations Charter uh, values, for example, those tend to be the things that everyone shares as values, and those have been used 
very extensively, sometimes with fairness, sometimes like a greenwash kind of narratives, but still they are important and at least a lot of lots of companies are are using that in their narratives. You mentioned social media, and I don't want to leave the room without uh, promoting my own social media. Not be, I'm not selling anything. Uh, the, re the reason is every day, not not for the last three or three days, but usually uh, constantly, I share short educational posts. I don't promote Very brands. Important. I don't promote um, stones. I just share information that might be helpful at the counter to tell a story, whether it is on history, geography, gemology, mineralogy, geology, whatever. But there might be uh, every day there is something in there that a salesperson can take. And the reason I started doing that social media was for my students originally. So they could, when they were preparing for exam, they would have some, some little things that they could take from social media, from my social media to help them in their exam. Then it expanded and uh, all of this, I'll, I'm, I'll, I'm sharing now in the, uh, in the chat log, uh, all of a sudden it became a big thing within our industry. It's, uh, I mean, we live in a bubble. I, I have many followers, but when we compared with Cristiano Ronaldo, I don't have none, but still um, I, I do it for education. I don't do it to promote anybody, myself or any organization. Uh, there is always something there that can help people selling and it is free. So that's my contribution. <clears throat> I'd also just like to add that, um, you know, it's very important that we're sensitive uh, just on this question of, um, you know, our responsibility, but not to impose our standards on other yeah. cultures or countries, you know, but like you say, the United Nations is, is you know, you know, one of these organizations from which you, we all understand 17 sustainable development goals, you know, is something that we at Greenland Ruby um, aim to achieve, uh, certainly by the year 2030. We've done that on, on multiple levels. Not everybody is able to do that. And that's not because they're not good people. It's because, you know, different cultures operate in different ways, different mining operations in different countries operate. It's not that they're wrong. It's that, you know, this is the way that they've been operating. And, you know, so very important not to impose standards on others. But certainly, we love to talk about our standards because they 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 are what they are, and we're proud of that, and and we love to 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 talk about it and how we we are achieving and plan to achieve the seventeen sustainable development goals, but of course not to compare with others who are perhaps not there yet, um, but with an, an industry such as ourselves, which is very very traditional to become a leader or to set an example for how operations can and should operate. But again, not to impose our standards on others, but to be proud of what we do and to share that. Because I think also we're very, very good within our industry to talk amongst ourselves about you know, what we do and you know, how we do it. But yeah, through channels like this or through social medias, like you know what, what Rui does every day uh, to really educate the consumer because uh, we all know what we do. I know what you do, you know what I do. You know, most of our sort of network within our industry understand what Greenland Ruby do, uh, but we need to get that out there. It's our responsibility to do that. Definitely, thank you. Very so, good point, Haley, very good point. Yeah, very, very good point. Uh, sorry, Rui, one last question before we open up the uh, the panel to the uh, to the attendees for their questions. Um, Rui, so what what are the factors that differentiate the people that are the best of the best? Because you've been educating and training uh, many people throughout the, your time in, in this industry. What factors do you feel differentiate the people that are the best of the best from the rest? Like That's what is an government? excellent question. And, yes. And, and sorry, uh, uh, on the flip side, what factors do you see? Like, why do people give up doing this business and move on to something else? And how can they become better at their roles in this industry and progress further with better results? If you could answer that. Yeah, very. I will try to, to. The first thing you must ask yourself is how bad do you want it? Because if your answer is I want it badly, then you will give up everything to become, I mean, not the best, but to become really good at it. You will have sacrifice, you will save money to, to buy books, to attend seminars, to travel, to learn with the best. 
and uh, it, it takes time and patience. It's not something that you make in one or two years. It takes, like playing the violino and make no mistake, I'm, I know what I'm, I'm, what I'm telling you. I don't play violino, I play the guitar, but to play well, you need at least 10 good years practicing every single day. It is the same in our trade. You need patience and you need to know that it will take time and you need to commit yourself. And uh, in, in this industry, in every other industry, what makes success? It's not where, where, where are you going, but how, what do you do when you fell down? And uh, people, when they fell down one time, two times, maybe they quit and they move on. It's okay. Maybe this is not for them. But if you keep struggling and struggling and struggling, either mm. you are like the man or you are, you really want it really badly. And it's the way it. that you, and that you keep going that will, will guide you to success but it takes time, it's not immediate. It takes 10, 15 years to get there. But uh, if you want to walk that path with patience, with sacrifice, if you want to starve comfortably, because uh, of course we in this industry, we, we are not millionaires, but we can live a comfortable life. But if you want to have that kind of sacrifice, you will get there. People that leave the industry, maybe it's because they don't have financial recognition out of it, so they try something else, or maybe they didn't want this so badly that they just moved on and doing something else as well. So I think the first question is, how bad do you want that? If you want it badly, you will get it, honestly. I would love to just add to that. I mean, it's really fun. I mean, if you've ever attended any of our industry um, events, uh, the, the color gemstone industry is indeed very colorful. And the, the characters are very, very colorful. You know, when you when you look at, at, at some of these people whose names we've mentioned today, you know, Vincent Poggio or Richard Hughes, you know, there is such a passion, Rui, you know, there is such a passion behind yeah. what, what, what you do. You know, and that's what it takes. I mean, let's let's face it. This is the, the same for, for 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 most industries or most experts. Are, you know, on that sort of level. I mean, it really does take passion and dedication. Um, but the colored gemstone industry really is a, I must say, a very interesting, very special bunch of bunch of very very passionate people. And uh, that is really, I think, um, what's what's been great fun for me throughout my career and. And, and what has kept me in my career and what has um, really, you know, given me the opportunity to share my knowledge and my experience, of, you know, from, from, from the mining operations through to the marketplace is, is my real excitement for this process, um, not just for the colored gemstones themselves, but, you know, for the people that we work every day with. And um, I think that really is, it has a lot to do with um how well you do it that's yeah that's a very very good point so uh so now we will uh, open up the panel the questions for the audience so i think first we'll go with uh with gochen uh, uh i'm sorry to mispronounce your name if i do uh grunto uh so so he he directs this question to Haley. Uh, Haley, would you, uh, how would you approach an owner or manager of a store whose employees are in need of training or upskilling while the owner or manager is in denial? Well, um, that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I just think that, that if you are the owner or a manager of a store, you would want your staff to be equipped with as much information and education as possible. And like I've said in, in the last hour or so, 45 minutes that we've been on this uh, discussion, um, I have tried to make that as easy as possible for the owner or the manager of the store by saying, yeah, look, here it is, you know, by putting that in, in people's hands and making it as easy as possible for them. It's of no expense or time or energy of theirs to try to educate their staff on Greenland Ruby. That's on me. All you need to do is put this book in people's hands or to connect them with an, with an online link to provide the, the information that's needed. So I'm not really asking the, the owner or the manager to, to really do anything other than to make sure their sales associate gets their hands 
on, on the information that, I, that I've made available to them. So it doesn't get much easier than that. But I think that that's sometimes where sort of, you know, the, 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 um, the Bermuda Triangle of information comes in is that it doesn't get, get passed on effectively. Um, that's why I've taken it upon myself to make that very, very easy. Uh, I'm not asking anybody to do anything other than A, either print that manual, or if you don't want to print it, I'll send it to you. I'll print it and I'll send it to you. To how many staff do you have in your in your store? If you have 10 staff, I'll send you 10 manuals. Or, you know, here's the online link. So just simply to make sure that your sales staff has that in their hands. Um, and more than that, they really don't have to do. So if they're still in denial after that, then I don't know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't That's make it drink. That's great. Uh, Haley, while I'm going to ask the next question to Rui from, uh, from one of the attendees, would you be able to pay, uh, post the link on the chat available of, uh, of the booklet? Oh, absolutely. I'm happy to do that. Uh, um, so, so Rui, uh, we have Omkar Desai uh, asking this question. Can you please tell three or four important points what not to say or do while facing customers, um, but uh, go and buy some uh, somewhere else. Uh, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, I mean, uh, negative wordings. For example, if you are talking about in diamonds, if you are talking about inclusions, uh, the name inclusion might not be familiar to the consumer. But if you say internal characteristics, maybe they can understand that is something within the stone. Uh, if you say defects. Well, in science, the fact has a meaning. In our life, the fact has another meaning. Avoid using the word defect. Avoid using the word semi-pressures because semi-pressures is asking for, okay, give me a semi-price. So meaning 50% discount. So semi-pressures is an expression that hasn't been there for decades. It's still, it's there among the vernacular in many languages, but in our trade nomenclature is not used anymore. Other words that you should not ever say and the counter, which is never and always, because in gemology, in my experience, never is something that you could should never say, pardon my redundancy and I'm, I'm being inconsistent and always is all, also something that sometimes it doesn't happen. For example, let me give you an example. When people say, oh, it is impossible to know if a green diamond has been irradiated. Well, we have means, scientific means to do that. Um, today, they were not available many years ago in some cases. Another case, acamarine. We know that acamarines can be heat treated and usually we'd say that the treatment is under, undetermined. So the laboratory cannot determine if an acamarine was or, or was or heat it or not but maybe science may uh, uh, figure it out later the same with irradiated tourmaline for example science cannot figure it out today but maybe it can figure it out tomorrow so avoid the words always and never uh, but those are very technical but using negative words like the facts um, semi-pressures any word that can have bear a negativity into that never use in any sale Perfect. Thank you. And so much. Uh, so, sorry, uh, another thing that you should never say is I don't know. Yeah. I don't know is something that the politicians learn with the politicians. If a customer asks you something that you really don't know, you should say, well, well I don't have enough information here to deliver that information, but I, I will get back to you later from our experts or from our team, and we will reach out to you. So give me your email address or your phone number so we can we can satisfy your curiosity. But at this moment, I cannot I cannot do it for you, unfortunately. That's one way of uh, of saying that. But never say I don't know. That's because that's uh, a, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great point. That's actually I think a lot of. Uh, salespeople must be saying, I don't know. And I think that really does clarify for a lot of salespeople as well as store owners. That's a very good point. Yeah. Uh, so we have uh, Zore Amini over here uh, asking, is there any idea about the volume of mines for gemstones to encourage people to get them and considering encouraging people to buy, will there be some left for future generations? So, uh, Haley, 
Um, Look, I, mean, I, I mean, this is a very good question. I mean, colored gemstones, and if you under, uh, understand origin and, and the rarity of these gems, this is a non-renewable uh, resource. In the case of Greenland Ruby, these gems have been in formation for the last three billion years. Uh, once they're mined, once they're mined, they're mined. Uh, you know, this is a this is a fine line to to walk between rarity and availability. The end of the day, as I said, this is non renewable resource. These gems come out of the ground after millions of years in formation, and when they're gone you know, then what? But when are they going to be gone is the eternal question. You know, when we talk about Tanzanite, we always talked about a 30 year supply. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. you know, it's yeah. it's tough to know exactly how much is in the earth, but more importantly, what is the cost of mining at a certain stage? You know, the deeper you go into the into the ground, what is the cost of mining and what is the cost of the gemstone? And is it is it is it a, a proposition that these mining operations keep going? I mean, we, we in the colored gemstone industry, we know many mining operations that simply, you know, have been mined out and don't exist anymore. Pariba Tourmaline from Brazil, very, very difficult to get your hands on. The mines are closed. There is no more, there is no more material in the ground. So for future generations, uh, it's hard to it's hard to to know exactly what's going to be available and what's not, but uh, certainly it's very difficult to convey the rarity of colored gemstones um, and exactly what's left in the ground and and if there will be more discoveries. Um, it's a very difficult question to answer, I must say. The rarity factor is enormous. And this is what we really do need to share. You know, that sometimes people say, well, how rare is it? You know, how rare is Tanzanite? I see so much of it. I go to the Caribbean, I see it. Yeah, but that's what you're seeing. Beyond that, there, there may not be much more. I don't know. Will they come across another mine somewhere? Will they? We don't know that yet. Yeah, Very that's, and, la and ladies and gentlemen, you just watched a true professional marketeer uh, entertaining a very critical subject that I would in a totally different way but Haley, he's, she's able to uh, convey it with passion and with a marketeer narrative. That's, that is why um, uh, marrying or making a marriage between um, gemology or science and what Haley just did brilliantly. That's why I admire her so much. She can, she can entertain the same subject from a perspective to give a a fascinating and a, a sense of urgency to the purchase. That, that's what's behind what Haley just mentioned as a professional marketeer. And uh, Haley, it's in your blood. It's, uh, it's, uh, you do it so naturally. And I think this kind of, uh, I couldn't do what you do because I don't have the same kind of, uh, of uh, training or the same kind of, uh, of a sensibility towards the product. And this is why marketing and what you do brilliantly with the, and I, I know that you, you've done it before with other gemstones, now you are in, in Greenland, Ruby. What you do and your colleagues, what they do around the world, they complement totally what people like me and other colleagues do as well at the sales counter, because the retailer, he needs both approaches. Otherwise, they can be a boring salespeople of materials or just a, um, telling a romantic story about a dream that doesn't have doesn't connect with the material so both together in different percentages depending on the customer they are critical and you just did it live uh, with the question and that's brilliant this is what maybe salespeople should be telling when they are asked the question of, of this question of this uh, attendee of ours brilliant yep. Definitely. So we also have uh, Gochin again ask another question to uh, and is directed to you, Rui. Um, I, I understand you are coming from a very technical part of the gem industry. Any input you could provide in interpreting the technical parts of gemology into the emotional sales flow that is essential to a certain part of end customers? Yeah, it's a very, very good question. It's like uh, uh, when we are dating a girl. And if we start saying about, oh, those are epithelial cells and this is mucus, if you would, if we uh, make a very technical um, 
for people like me, that's why I say, if you understand the customer, customers like me, we, we like technical things. Uh, for example, watch buyers, people like, like watches, they like the technical complications of the mechanism. They like that kind of technical information. And so for them, uh, provided that you tell them in a way that they can, they can understand, that information is very important to close the sale. But if they don't care much about the technicalities, uh, even if you are very, very uh, eloquent in conveying those factors, they might kill the sale. They, they, they will not help you. So the critical thing is you can have the information. You can learn about that information. So I was trying to put on your on, on the chat log the, uh, the link for the Sibjo uh, uh, Retailers Reference Guide. Let me, but I, I think the link is not working today, but I'm going to put here Sibjo, then you can Google it. Retailers okay. Reference Guide. Oh, I'm, I'm doing some typos here, but Steve Joe Retailer's Reference Guide. Oh, it's a rare red. Sorry, it's a typo there, but I think you got that right. If you Google it, uh, there is a, it's a 70 page document with uh, stone by stone, uh, Alex and Dried, Amethyst, Citrine, uh, Ruby, Diamond, blah, 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 with very short stacked information, technical information that if you learn how, where to search for that information at the counter, you can just drip it if it is adequate for the sale to drip it. Otherwise, you, can, you should have other narratives. But yes, it's challenging to, to um, um, communicate technical technicalities. I love it, but I'm a geek. Uh, I'm a nerd, but some people's, uh, the majority of people are not like me. So, uh, yeah, you, but you should have the information so you could deliver it uh, when that information can differentiate the product or can tell the, the customer that you, we are asking for more money to this product because it has certain characteristics that are unique and that make, the, make it more unique. That's why uh, the, this product is better than the other. So it will cost more. But that's only on that occasion that you should uh, work with information, with technical information, I think. Perfect. Great. So uh, I we're running short of time. So I think we'll take uh, two to three more questions. Um, let's, so let's go with uh, Uday Sangani's uh, question. Uh, can, you give your can you give your Indian perspective? What do you think Indian companies or Indian sales people should work on or not continue to do to become the best in class or on par with global sales workforce? I, I wouldn't know. I, I don't know the Indian market that well. I haven't ever worked with a, I, I worked with Indian colleagues, but never with an Indian company at the retail level to know exactly how it operates. So I wouldn't know how to answer, but I can accept an invitation to spend two weeks in India just to research that. And then I, I can answer the question. Definitely. Thank you. Um, so we have a Charles Evans uh, asking a question. It has been clear that in recent years, employers possibly for very valid reasons are less willing to invest in the education of employees. While this makes it easier for small targeted uh, teaching or learning, it does mean that we risk having staff who know specifics about particular stones or brands and have less breadth and depth in their knowledge. Haley, could you comment on the opportunity in this form uh, in this from the point of view of a commercial entity like Greenland Ruby and Rui, how would you, uh, how would you educators address this? Should formal gem gemology courses be more modular like GIS? Mm. So Do yeah, you start, Hilly, Hilly, you would like to start and Rui, if you would like to. Yeah, and thank you for the question, Charles. I mean, again, uh, I, I'm just reiterating what I'm talking about. Put that, put that information into people's hands. You know, yes, it is all available online. We know that. But you also, I mean, I don't expect that people go and Google and do their own research. I mean, of course, there are people that love to do that. And, though, you know, these are, you know, you know, the people that sort of set themselves apart from others. But the only way to make sure that people actually get the information that you want them to have is by putting it in people's hands. And, and that's my that's my answer to that. And, you know, more than that, we cannot do. But, you know, I take it upon myself to to equip 
the the, the store owner or the uh, the manager with with that information. If I want, if I expect them to know um, not only the the romance but the technicalities behind the rubies and pink sapphires from Greenland, I need to put that information in their hands. What makes a Greenland ruby or pink sapphire different from any other ruby? I can't expect that somebody goes and Google's and re uh, researches that themselves. I need to tell them that so that they are equipped with that information. So that's my answer. And I've, I've repeated myself over the last hour. I mean, I think in the beginning and the end of it is putting information in people's hands. There's a, a couple of different ways of doing that, but that is, that is in fact my responsibility. And it's my responsibility also that educators like Rui or um, schools like GIA or you know any of those other um, gemological institutions also have my information on hand so that they can share that with their students so that ultimately it trickles down to where it needs to be. Yeah, um, good question, Charles. And uh, um, there are, my, from my personal experience, when, when, I, when I am offered, like a, when I'm discussing with a company to educate their staff, mm -hmm. uh, depending on the size of the company, uh, I always try to make a bespoke project for them so so they can learn the basics of what is in their product so they can they can know the products better and they can tell the story uh, in a way but i always try to involve also the business owner and whoever is in the middle purchasing the uh, inventory that is being sold so because uh, when you educate who is buying your inventory to ask the right questions to the supplier then you are, are already collecting information that you will give to your um, to your um, salespeople to convey to uh, the consumer what Haley is doing at Greenland Ruby uh, if they are suppliers of a jewelry factory, for example, for rubies, they will provide all the information. You don't have to ask because they provide, but not that all, not all suppliers of loose gemstones or finished jewelry have that kind of product dossier where you can have all the information that you can pass on to the uh, sales counter. Let's um, uh, learn from the watch industry. Every watch is accompanied. Uh, oh, my my English! It's uh, accompanied. It has. It ha there is a little booklet and a lot of information that goes along with every single uh, complicated watch. And make no mistake, the salespersons they know the the consumers they know exactly what they are. And if you want to have a nice shop. Uh, if you want to be successful selling watches, you should know your product. Otherwise, they will go buying elsewhere. And we, we should learn from them to have a, a more product knowledge that they can search themselves, but they can ask the supplier for that kind of information. Regarding the gemology education, yes, I agree that uh, more and more um, what GIA is doing and other schools are doing, uh, offering modular uh, courses, they, they, they can offer the students, if, if they are at a retail level, they might not wish to know exactly, they don't need to know how to take a refractive index or a specific gravity or a hardness test. Maybe that's not a critical information that will give them a strategic advantage to close a sale. They might need other type of information, but that depends on how deep you want to go. But uh, modular, um, for example, I don't want to give uh, specific examples, but schools, they do have smaller, simpler, not very technical approaches uh, to gemstones that can definitely give that kind of intro, uh, intro uh, uh, information for salespeople to understand the basics of the gem materials they are selling. But again, I insist, it's not taking a course or having a diploma that will make you knowledgeable, is about 10 years of experience with that knowledge that you took on the course that will give you the confidence. Because the, it's like when, you, when we um, have the driving license, we don't know how to drive. We just know the rules. Uh, learning how to drive takes more time, takes, it takes experience. And uh, learning the gemology on a course, it's okay, but then you need experience to be confident in not saying nonsense because it happened to me. So I had a, my FGA and DGA, and I thought that I was, well, 
I have a DGA. I have an, I thought I knew everything, and of course I didn't. So I made a lot of mistakes, and uh, we all do at the beginning. But we should we should put our feet on the ground and understand that this this is a very long process. It's a continuing education process. You don't know you don't learn everything on a course. That's just an introduction, and then you have to to keep on learning and self learning, on the job. Perfect. So I think we'll take one last question. This is from Vishal Rui. How should a salesman portray a treated gemstone to the customer? Good, bad, or acceptable due to the rarity of finding a non-treated gemstone? That's an excellent question. I, I'm, I'm given that question all the time. Um, let's, let's go back 300 years, shall we? 300 years ago, our ancestors, I don't know if you have aristocrats on the audience, but our ancestors, we were in the bush. We were agricultural uh, peasants. We didn't, we didn't have money to wear jewelry. Only the uh, powerful, the aristocrats or the, the, the rulers, they, they were actually, um, uh, they were wealthy enough to be, to wear jewelry. So there was a sense of luxury and a sense of uh, rarity on every gemstone that was used 300 years ago. Well, today we have middle classes. Since the, the industrial revolution, that the number of jewelry consumers exploded totally. We have millions and millions of consumers, not only the rich and wealthy. I mean, when we see Cristiano Ronaldo jewelry, I'm sure that he uses the best of the best, the best diamonds, the best rubies, the best everything, as the kings and queens and the powerful used to 300 years ago. But today we have people like myself, like my family, like all our families that finally we have disposable income in the end of the month to spend in whatever we wish. That's called middle class. And middle classes, those are the ones pushing the jewelry industry forward. And the, the, the jewelry industry cannot rely on the very unique best of the best unheated rubies, sapphires, the um, unfilled emeralds, the uh, untreated um, whatever, uh, citrines, amethysts, tourmalines, and, and what have you, to have the best of the best jewelry. Otherwise, you will not have factories working. So you should, um, like in the food industry, you, you should have enough material. And so you do a certain type of cosmetic to make it affordable to the middle classes, to make it affordable to everyone. This is the true story. You don't convey this history to a consumer because he will be bored to death. The truth is, we still have the best of the best, but that has a premium on that. You just open that Sotheby's or uh, Christie's catalog auction, and we can see uh, sapphire, ruby, and uh, emerald, diamond, paraiba tourmaline, or Jedi jade uh, being worth millions of dollars. Uh, but we, we see that no heat, no oil, no treatment, and that's the, the, that's the uh, uniqueness of something that was left untouched. Like me, I'm not wearing makeup today. So I'm as I was, maybe I should need a treatment to be more good looking, but the gemstones need that. Otherwise, they will not be um, available in the prices they are. S take citrine, for example. M we have natural citrine, yellow quartz, but most of it is either irradiated or it is heated. Blue topaz. Mo we have blue natural blue topaz, for example, in the Ukraine and in Brazil. But for the industry, we need them in amounts that are not available in nature. So we irradiate it and anneal them so they become blue, or we can use the coating technique to make them blue. And I could go on and on to many gemstones, telling that they are only available on that color, that transparency, because of treatments. And the amount number here is critical because we are working as uh, in, for the middle classes, for the industry, in mass producing jewelry. That's what makes our industry going. Is not the creme de la creme, is not the, uh, the flawless 100 carat diamond, the 50 carat uh, emerald for Colombia, or the 25 carat cashmere sapphire that is sustaining our industry and our jobs. It's the middle class, it's treated gemstones and we need them. But 
to convey the story, it really depends on who you have on the other side. But the price and, tag, that's the most important thing. And may I also just add that when it comes to colored gemstones, like what we've been saying, you know, it is in the eyes of the beholder and the beauty. And um, it's not always about the treatment or the no treatment. I mean, like what Rui says, you know, with the bigger, very important stones, yes, it makes a difference. But on a commercial everyday level, you know, let's not confuse the consumer. Let's be transparent. Of course, we have to be. That's what it's all about in our industry. Um, but, you know, let's just be clear um, for want of a better description of, you know, how a gemstone is treated. And this is what actually allows us, especially at Greenland Ruby, to responsibly bring these gemstones into the marketplace. So, you know, let's see it all in context and uh, just be uh, transparent without disclosure of certain treatments. It's a very big topic in our industry, uh, but it does take understanding. I mean, you'll find on our website at Greenland Ruby full disclosure on our form of treatment. But again, it is what allows us to responsibly bring our gemstones into the marketplace in the quantity that's necessary to drive our business. Because let's face it, it's the quantity that is going to drive our business. It's not the, the one-off stone that sells here or there. It's the fact that we are able to produce a consistent supply for jewelry manufacturers all over the world that actually keeps us in business. And this actually answers a question that was posed a little while ago. I saw it uh, in our Q&A. You know, why, why is it that, that, that colored gemstones, you know, I haven't been available? Well, because, you know, there is a rarity factor. And, you know, compared to the diamond industry, you know, um, the, col the colored gemstone industry does, is not always able to offer a consistent supply. It has to do with certain treatments or availability. So spot that's on. why we, yeah, spot, spot we say on, it. Hey, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, but it's, and it's the through, challenge through is to communicate. Yeah. yeah, through through communication, through disclosure, um, you know, and just in the more education we put out there, the better it is for everybody. Not 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 just within our industry and communicating this to one another, but directly to the <laughs> consumer, and so that they understand. Let's not confuse them. Or, or scare them away in any in any way, shape, or form. That's sometimes what we see what happens in our industry too. If we're not clear with what we're doing, that can cause damage on the consumer level. So we really want to make sure that the messages we put out there are very, very clear and that the consumer is not uh, scared away about what we're trying to uh I usually give an example in my classes with the food industry. I, I'm sure that you know the chicken McNuggets of McDonald's. Um, those chicken McNuggets, they cost here like a dollar, four of those McNuggets. And uh, we don't know, we don't wish to know what's inside. They taste like chicken, but they might not be chicken. But the only way they are $1 retail, it's because they might, I don't know what parts of the chicken or even the chicken is there, but it's, uh, it's treated food. That's the only way of having cheap McDonald's and cheap food is to pick up some scraps of the animal and treat them in some way uh, with the healthy treatments, of course, and, um, and make them available like ham. I'm, I'm from the time that a ham, which is the, the leg of a pork, it was really a muscle. And we could understand the morphology of the muscle when we were buying ham. But today is like a cube. I don't know what part of the pork is a cube, but that means that you have little pieces of meat in that cube that we call processed ham. And we pay less to be able to have it available at a lower cost. And we, we eat it. I mean, people that eat meat or eat pork, we eat it. I love it, by the way. But and when we're talking about jewelry, it's pretty much the same principle. Mass production has caused all the products to become somewhat treated to make them available to every one of us. Otherwise, they wouldn't be available. Yeah, that's that's a really really good example that you just put put out there, uh, Rui. Uh, so to conclude, so I think now we'll conclude the the session. Thank you for sharing your valuable uh, time and expertise. And this has been a very insightful discussion. Um, we would also like to thank the audience for being an active uh, for being an active one throughout the session. And we hope you enjoyed it and use this knowledge to your advantage in your respective businesses. So thank you and have a great day and stay safe, everyone.
Mm. Well, thank you, thank Priti, you very for much for so having me. Very well organized, and it was a great to see Haley, and it, uh, you did it well. Thank you, thank you so much, Rui and Haley. Your your time and your your insights have really benefited everyone on this webinar. And yeah, perfect. Thank you. Good night. Thank you so much, and thanks thanks for having us. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.